Hello, Bull Files! I've been thinking a lot about gouging lately, and it's probably because I just got a new gouger. It's an Enola Day or Inlady, I'm not really sure how you say it, but I'm really pleased with the reads I've been able to make on it. I mean, the high notes just pop out! It's crazy! Some people say that the gouge is really fundamental to the way that the reads work, and I had my doubts, but I have to say I agree with that now. Don't worry though, I'm going to take you through the whole process from the box to the setup to how to gouge with this kind of complicated machine and then I'm even going to scrape up a couple reads and play test them so you can hear them and let me know what you think. If you love them or hate them, as always let me know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe. Okay, so as previously seen, the gouger comes in pieces inside this really cool padded box. Uh, let's take it apart and put it together. So something about using this gouger is you're going to need to clamp it down. So you need kind of a table that has a kind of square edge. The reed table that I use normally has more of a rounded edge, so I can't clamp on this gouger to that, to that table. Uh, but luckily I'll be changing workstations soon, so hopefully the gouge will be able to clamp onto the new table. So we have a couple parts here. We have the main apparatus. Uh, notice that it has a kind of jutting out piece here. I'm not sure what you call this part here that grabs onto the clamp. But that needs to face outward towards you. So make sure that the gouge is facing the right way. Uh, I guess you have the knob of the pusher on the left side of the gouger. Uh, and then you'll be clamping it down to the table. Then is the crank, and I guess this appendage is a good word for it, but this is to put the crank on. So this will control the pusher, allow you to push the reed, or not the reed yet, but the piece of cane to make the reed forward and backward. The next piece that comes out of the box is very important, it's the spring. And these springs can get sprung, I guess. They can get deformed, uh, so be sure to only put it on when you're actually using the gouger, not just leave it on permanently. And that will go on these two pins on the right side, so I'll turn it around so you can see it. Uh, but these are to hold the piece of cane in place so that the pusher pushes the piece of cane through the blade. And we're going to be hooking the spring onto these two I guess they're not really hooks, uh, but appendages here. Uh, so there's the first one, and I, I'll do it while it's clamped down so it doesn't move. I can hook it on there. The spring does take a little bit of force to get on the first time, and the springs are very uh, tight, I guess. Like, they have a lot of coefficient of springiness. <laughs> so they will resist the pull, especially the first few times. Uh, but... If you are careful, you can do so without so much uh, drama. Okay, so the spring part is probably my least favorite part of putting the machine together, uh, just because it's so difficult to do, but just have a little bit of patience. Um, it might seem tempting to just grab it from the very end of the spring, but if you grab it from the spring itself, it's a lot easier to stretch. The last part that we need to hook on is the dial indicator. Now this is a little tricky part because we're all going to use relative measurements. So you want to unscrew this little holding pin in the holder, we'll call it. And what this does is it measures how far the blade rises or falls. So we're just using relative measurements. Uh, so just put it in so it lightly touches the top of the blade. I guess the blade carriage maybe? Although it's not really a true carriage like in the traditional gougers. Um, and then make sure you tighten it into place so that it won't move once you start moving the bed. So just a quick little vocabulary on the parts of the machine. We have this section here, this lever, that will lock the blade in place or unlock it. So we have an unlocked position which is forward, and we have a locked position which is what you should use when you're gouging. If you forget to lock it, your cane will actually run into it, and then you'll have to break that piece of cane to get it out. So Remember to lock it so you don't waste a lot of cane. When it's unlocked, you can move this wheel down below, and this will raise and lower the blade. 
Notice that the dial turns as we move the wheel. And this is because the blade is actually moving up and down. So we can use this to measure how much the cane is actually moving as well. And when it's in position, we'll lock it, and then we'll push with the crank the cane through the gouging machine. So it actually took me a long time to learn how to use the machine and I had a lot of trial and error. You want to use a dial micrometer to test the thickness of the gouge as you're gouging. That way you know if it's doing it correctly or not because there's a tendency to gouge too much all at once. The instructions that come with the machine say to do two passes, one of them at 80 and the other one landing at 60. I find that the biggest problem is uh, <laughs> finding out where 80 actually is going to be. Uh, because the dial indicator is only a relative measurement on the machine and you need to test it against a freestanding dial indicator. And the machine comes with one, uh, but I like to use my own that I've been using since I've had a gadget machine, uh, just because I, I know the feel of it a little bit better. But I definitely was pulling my hair out trying to figure out how to get the machine to work initially. Uh, so just make sure that you're patient and have plenty of cane to work with. A lot of people say that the machine is intended to be used with dry cane. Uh, so we have a couple pieces of dry cane, but I'm going to be using wet cane as well, just because I feel like intuitively this will make the gouge last longer uh, because the dry cane is really tough uh, and hopefully the wet cane will be easier on the blade and the blade will last longer. Okay, so we'll give it a shot. The first pass, remember, is going to be at 80. And my dial... Okay, so the issue is every time you put the machine together, it's really hard to get the dial to be exactly where you left it. So I'll kind of face it towards the camera here. Oops, you can see already I'm moving it a lot. So it's hanging out at 90. Um, but we want to be really conservative with where the dial is reading for the blade height. So even though it says 90, let's make sure that's tight, um, I'm actually going to move the blade all the way to the lowest possible setting. Yeah, so the, oh, yeah, so the highest possible setting. All right, so at the highest possible setting, we're gonna put that as zero. Is that right? I hope so. And again, when you're setting it up, you might sacrifice a couple pieces of cane because it's hard to remember if the lowest setting is what you want to be zero or the highest setting. Uh, so we'll find out together. Okay, so I'm just think, trying to think of this logically. If the blade is higher, it'll take off less cane, right? I think that checks out. So then if I move it this way, Nothing's changing. Okay, so I think I was actually incorrect. So I think if we move it most to the left, or most counterclockwise, that should be the lowest setting. So we'll just readjust the uh, micrometer here. So we want to move it most, as far as possible, counterclockwise, or to the left, or away from you. All the same thing, right? And then reset your micrometer on the machine, and that'll be your zero, your lowest setting. And you can either like kind of push it so it goes to zero, which is really hard, or you can move the dial head. I'm gonna try getting it so it's on zero. There we go. Good. Oh, there we go. Okay, so now it's on zero. And so this is the setting we're using for the first pass. So now I'm going to move it to 80. And allegedly, this should, Gouge the cane. I'm actually gonna gonna 
go past. We're going to go all the way to 90, and we'll see how that gouges first to measure. Okay, so now we lock the blade, because if we don't, the cane will run into it, and I've done that plenty of times. It's very frustrating. And then we're going to push the, blade, the cane through. And as we push the cane through, a nice strip of it comes off, which is awesome, both on the side here and from the top, so that's really cool. And just push it through all the way so that the parts are easy to take out. And now that it's through, we can check with the micrometer. And we have a piece of cane that is at 110, so 110 micrometers. So it's too thick, and that's okay. That's what we wanted. So we know, though, that in order to get down to 60, we're going to go down 50 micro micrometers. And the dial indicator here does work for relative measurements. So we'll just unlock it, hold the thing back via pusher, and we'll move it so that the setting is 50 micrometers smaller. So 90 minus 50 is 40. Um, but that seems pretty scary to me. So I'm going to leave it here at 60 first. We'll do another pass because we can always do a third pass, um, but we cannot put cane back on. So always be more conservative than liberal with how much cane you're going to take off with each pass. And again, you want to push it all the way through, take a piece of cane off, pull it out, and we'll measure. And we barely took any off, which, okay, that's kind of uh, to expect it. So now we have 80, which is great. The thing is, too, is like the smaller strips you take off, the more accurate the machine tends to be. Uh, my first couple of passes, I would take off what I thought would land at 60, and it would be like at 40. So impossible to make a read from that. So unlock the blade and move it down now. Move it down 20, which is where we thought it would be but I was not confident enough to try it. I'm going to leave it so it's a little, well, let's just put it. So now it's at 40. On this micrometer, we'll lock the blade in place, and then I'll push a piece of cane through for hopefully the last time. And you're starting to see, like, the, the strips now are translucent, so they're very thin. And we'll measure it. And now we're at 61. So almost perfect. I do think that it's better to have a little bit thicker gouge with this uh, machine just because uh, the wreaths tend to be really easy and free blowing. And mm -hmm. if you take off too much, it's easy to be flat. But let's see if we can have the precision to take off a single micrometer. through for the last time and it's taken off just a little bit of cane and we'll measure it again and not really <laughs> it has a hard time doing one full micrometer in fact this is measuring at the same exact measurement so uh, let's move it down just a little bit more and we'll see if we can get the blade to be just in the right spot Ideally, you'd be doing whole batches at each measurement, so the cane would be more consistent. It's just when you're doing a single piece of cane that's not very efficient, uh, because you're being very picky with it. At least I am. Okay, we'll try that. All the cane's gotten on the wheels. And there we are, right at 60. Okay, cool. So, yep, right at 60. Great. So this piece of cane, I'm excited to make a read from it. Uh, 60 millimeters is where I like to have my gouge. I know some people like to have it a little thicker or a little thinner, but the precision of the machine is amazing to me. And then we'll take a brush and clean the skin off. So lately I've been scraping my reeds over three days. When I made the reed making videos that you can see if you check out the other videos on the channel, I usually make those over two days, but I've kind of switched over to a longer process since then. 
And I think that works with this gouge really well. So I'm gonna try three reads for you. I'm only gonna do, I guess I have four reads here, but we'll try three that I've made most recently. And I'm only gonna do two read tests on them. Now, if you need instructions on how to test a read more thoroughly, I have a whole video for that, which is linked in the description. But we're just gonna test the response in the low register and then do a little octave test to make sure the read sits up. The pitch. All right, let's try the first one. So what you're looking for is a clean attack, and I think this read does it. Now I'll try the octave test. Now you don't want to help the read out at all, so doing it quickly can really reveal if the read is able to jump up like that easily. So that, so that checks out for me, and let's try the next one. So this one's a lot more open, but it still responds really well in the low register. <laughs> it's a little over soaked, but if you just kind of brush the water away, uh, you can get it to calm down a little bit. There we go. So not as responsive as the first one, but still very responsive. Now the octave test. and it sits up plenty. This one's way more open, so that has to do with the radius of the king, but let's check out read number three. And this one's a little bit shorter than the rest, but I hope it still works. So this one's extra responsive. It might be a little bit too like active for me. I may want to taper it down, but let's see if it passes the test. Low response. Extra response pretty well, just have to kind of get used to it. It's a little bit more open as well as the, than the first one. I think the first one's my favorite right now. But it responds really well. Good. No extra noise at the beginning of the note is what I'm looking for. Now the octave test. No, I got some water in the octave key. Hang on. Okay. And you can just be really lyrical in these reads. I definitely like this gouge, and I hope to make more reads on it. Maybe I'll go record some etudes or something, or at least practice. Um, if you enjoy these videos, don't forget to let me know what you think. You can always check out more free Oval resources in the description, as well as on obofiles.com. And when in doubt, play beautifully.